Welcome. Thank you for being here on a Saturday. This is our 20th conversation on Buddha nature. So this is a series of online interviews with Buddhist practitioners, scholars, and thinkers on the topic of Buddha nature, hosted by Tsadra Foundation in association with the educational resource website, buddhanature.org. For this event, our regular host, Lopan Dr. Karma Punso, will speak with Dr. Peter Skilling. You can watch all the past events on the buddhanature.org resource website, and there are all now available as both video and audio recordings that you can download and play anytime. <laughs> so please feel free to send questions with the Q&A function on Zoom or on Facebook comments during the discussion, and we'll have a time set aside for questions with the speakers at the end. So Peter Skilling is a special lecturer at Chulalongkorn University and the founder and president of the Fragile Palm Leaves Foundation in Bangkok, where he has been collecting and preserving Buddhist texts for many years. Born in New Hampshire, he was educated in Paris and held various positions and visiting professorships around the world, including in Oxford, Harvard, the Sorbonne, and many others. Peter's publications include numerous articles and several books spanning from the 1970s to today, including the recent Questioning the Buddha from Wisdom Publications, how Theravada is Theravada from University of Washington Press and the great Mahasutras, Great Discourses of the Buddha. As you all know, Lopan Dr. Karma Punso is the recipient of Tsadra Foundation's Writer and Digital Residence Grant for Buddha Nature Studies and is our host for these conversations on Buddha Nature. Karma Punso is one of Bhutan's leading intellectuals and completed both monastic training in the Tibetan traditions as well as a doctorate at Oxford. He is the founder of the Loden Foundation in Bhutan, and his work is well known across the Himalayas and Buddhist study circles around the world. So, without further ado, please welcome Peter Skilling and Karma Punzo. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, and welcome Ajahn Peter and uh, everybody else. Um, it's wonderful to gather again online. So before we start the session, if you can spend a few moments to generate the altruistic sort of bodhicitta. So as uh, Marcus said earlier, we have had this forum for now uh, over two years. And uh, we had this forum mainly to bring together, uh, bring um, scholars and practitioners working on Buddha nature together to share different perspectives and enrich not only our understanding and knowledge of Buddha nature, but also to promote the, the message of Buddha nature to a wider sort of audience. And um, Ajahn, we have been long thinking about bringing you on board because you come with this exceptional um, and unique uh, expertise of uh, working on early sutras, both on the, in the Pali tradition as well as uh, the Sanskrit and Tibetan traditions. So it's great to have you, Ajahn. And uh, I would like to start by asking you how you started your interest and career in Buddhist studies and uh, landed up on working with uh, both the Pali suttas as well as the Mahayana sources. Ah, oh, thank you. That is, you have shown me some of the questions you're going to ask. They're all very mm. demanding. Uh, how did I start was, I think, rather by accident. At that time, growing up in Toronto, there were not many living traditions or teachers around. And as you know, 1960s, there were even not many authoritative books. So I was interested in religions. I was interested in religions and then Eastern religions. And amongst them, I became attracted to Buddhism. And when I studied Buddhism, I think was quite non-sectarian, simply by what was available. And that included reading things like Dhammapada, and reading Zen, and reading Tibetan Buddhism. So that was my 
my beginning was already reading these different traditions and not having any real contact with, with the teaching traditions. So when I wanted to uh, later, much later on, when I became a monk and had monastic teachers, I read the Pali suttas in translation. And one of my teachers, particularly several of my teachers, particularly the Ku Wimelo, uh, when I would ask him question after question, he would say, the only way to really understand the suttas is to learn Pali, because the translations are inadequate. So that led me to learn Pali. And at the same time, I didn't want to have just one tradition. So I somehow or other decided to start to read Tibetan and read the Kanjur. So I, from the very beginning, let's say these I was studying these side by side, hand in hand. Yeah, and when you uh, went through these uh, comparative studies, working on sutras from uh, both the Pali and Sanskrit, which of course became later Tibetan tradition, um, and then you have published uh, books like the Mahasutras and more recently Questioning the Buddha, which all contain early sutras. How should we understand the relationship between the early sutras in the Pali tradition and what we have now in the Kanjur, for instance? So one, of course, belonging to the Theravada tradition, the other to Mula Sarvastivada. Are there overlaps? How close are they? What can we say about the the transmission of these different sutras? Yes, there are certainly overlaps. And if we talk about Kanjur and Chapitika in general, of course, one of the big overlaps is the Vinaya, the monastic rules, which both big, all Buddhist canons have a section on Vinaya. And although there are many differences, they have the overlap of the being the same, same, similar uh, format, similar intention is to explain and catalog the monastic duties. As for sutras, the Pali suttas, the Pali tradition is much more limited. They have only the collection of early, what we call early suttas. Uh, the Agamas and the Nikayas, and these overlap amongst the different schools as far as they are available, like the Sarvastivada and the Pali. Now in Tibetan, uh, for whatever reason, they did not translate the complete Agama equivalent to the Pali Nikayas. So in that sense, there are many suttas in the Nikayas in Pali, which are not found at all in Tibetan. And some very important texts, I would say, uh, could be useful to be translated into Tibetan. And on the other side, the Kenjur has the very big Tantra section, and the Pali has no equivalent whatsoever to that. So there are these wide divergences in the midst of which there are still many overlaps. Mm. So among the sutras in Pali, which have not been translated into Tibetan or which were probably, which didn't exist in Sanskrit when Tibetan translations were being done, what would be some sutras that you would recommend being translated into Tibetan now? Well, that's a big question, but just as one example is the collection on causation, Nidana Sangyutta, which is, I can't say, 150 pages in Pali of relatively short sutras, all of which deal in some way or other with uh, dependent arising, Pratishya Mupada. And there are some very great suttas there. 
And some of these are cited or quoted or summarized by masters like Thakarjuna and so on. And so that collection, I think, is to me, is very important for understanding Madhyamaka thought in particular. And that would be a great boon to have into Tibetan. But of course, I have no idea how mm. that should be done, whether they should translate into the old Kenjur style or into a contemporary or more contemporary form of Tibetan. So there's many decisions that would have to be made. Mm. Yeah, and uh, as we talk about overlaps, um, one concept over which I think the Theravada Pali Canon, as we know, or particularly the Anguttara Nikaya, and then <clears throat> the Mahayana Sutras we have in the Tibetan tradition, where the overlap is on this concept of luminosity. And uh, Anguttara Nikaya's uh, claim, uh, luminous bhikshus is this mind, but it's defiled by adventitious defilements. That's probably one of the earliest statements talking about luminosity, isn't it, uh, Ajahn? And because luminos luminosity is so important for Buddha nature studies, I would like you to elaborate a bit more on that. Oh dear. <laughs> yes. The Pali version is one of the earliest and most direct statements. And I think it's important to me that such statements as this often are rather unique and they're very forceful. So one feels, one gets the impression that this is the voice of the Buddha the voice of the Buddha nature, if you like, because it's a very forthright, fresh and original statement that you would not find in other contemporaneous or even later Indian religions or other world religions in this particular form. So this, yes, this, and so these are sort of key to me, key passages, you could almost say heart passages, hridya. Uh, passages not in the sense of a mantra, but in, in the sense of the heart of the teaching. I can't hear you, Karma. Sorry, um, you have a PowerPoint slide, uh, and if you have this passage on a slide, uh, would you like to share them now? Sure. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. I will try. Mm. I think, it, as you said, because this is a very powerful statement, which uh, you think is from the Buddha, it would be very, I think, uh, beneficial for the audience to get this. Uh, uh, yeah. This is the passage with the translation, very good translation by Bhikkhu Analyo, and the Pali is Pabasaram midam bhikkhuve ittam tanchako agantu kehi upakile sehi upakilitam tang asutava putu jano yatabu tang napajanati, and so on. So there are two basic statements, Pabasaram idam bhikkhuve chittam, and tanchako uh, and then the other one is Tangchako Agantukehi Upakilesehi Vipamutam. So it's the same thing. This mind is luminous, it is defiled by adventitious defilements, and then skip, and it is um, or this mind is luminous and it is free of adventitious defilements. So what does that mean? Uh, that is a debate that goes on in India, Tibet, China, Japan, Korea, up to the present. That is to say whether the 
luminous mind is naturally free, already liberated, or uh, whether we need to work to liberate it. This was my own free transla translation. Luminous is this mind of ours, shrouded though it may be, by clouds that course across the skies. Luminous is this mind of ours, free it is from the obscurations that swell up from the fathomless ocean of Alia. So that was my uh, version. Wonderful. Thank you for that very beautiful rendering of the passage from Angutara Nikaya. But uh, Ajahn, I want to ask you this. So something similar to this passage in the um, Kanjur canon would be the statement in the uh, Parjana Paramita Sutras. I think a few of them, including the Ashta Sasrika, mention that mind doesn't exist as mind, but is luminous by nature. Simni, Simsu, Machi, Simgi, Rashin, Yusava. So strikingly close to the statement from Anguttara Nikaya. So, what can you say about the source of this, the origin of these two? Did they share at one point a common source? Yeah, well, very difficult question. As I said, I think these are kind of heart passages, core passages that in a way were transmitted outside of the Agamas, just this passage. Even when I translated this on the shores of the sea, that was from memory from mm. 20 or 30 years ago, Pabasvara Midam Bikwe Chittam. So these uh, core, to me, these core passages would have been transmitted orally as ideas. The ideas come first, the texts, mm. written texts, uh, edited texts, organized into agamas, organized into uh, perfection of wisdom texts. Those are later manifestations of these uh, luminous ideas, which let's say mm. <laughs> they, they travel, they travel luminously. Uh, mm. through the space of the mind uh, and end up in different in different uh, sutras, different passages. Mm. And then um, as we um, as the Pali tradition develops, um, are there other agamas also suttas? talking about uh, luminosity or prabhasara in the Pali tradition, how important does this concept figure in the early uh, stages of Pali tradition? Yeah, well, that in a sense is a matter of interest and training in the sense that yes, there are other passages even using the same word, prabhasara chittam, but they are in different contexts, different uh, conversations of the Buddha with various figures. And it seemed to me that it was not, so to say, ironed out into a system. Mm. That these various references do exist. They are there if you read the various suttas, but mm. there was no... Uh, separating them out into a theory of luminosity. And maybe that comes up for the, I don't know if it's the first time, comes up in Maitreya's uh, Uttara Tantra, for example. <clears throat> so within the Pali, I think uh, others may correct me, but I think the references to luminosity were generally scattered in different re records of different teachings of the Buddha, different conversations attributed to the Buddha, but not systematized. Mm -hmm. So yes, luminous, luminosity is always shining, shining out here and there. When you look, you see it. But it is not a 
made into a an architecture of luminosity. Mm. Mm. So um, the concept of luminosity gets more systematized and develops further, mainly in the Mahayana tradition. But the the Pali tradition doesn't have much as a system. Are there also practices? I think we had a session with uh, Jack, who you know, and we were talking about Sama Arahan, which uh, probably is more sort of re recent development. But in the Sama Arahan meditation tradition, of course, there's a, a major role for uh, luminosity. Uh, would there have been certain such practices also in earlier uh, Pali and Theravada tradition? Yes, I think so. But the problem in regard to the relation between texts and their historical development is we have almost no social records of how these ideas were transmitted, how they were received, how they were developed. So I can only say that by impression. And if you look at the part I didn't translate in my one, uh, Tang asutava puta jano yata butang napajati. Pajanati, tasama asutava to puta jana satit bhavana nati ti wandami wadami ti. So the Buddha says, I declare that the uninstructed ordinary person, unenlightened person, does not know this luminous nature as it is, yata butang napajanati. And therefore, the uninstructed ordinary person has no titta bhavana. So this is a very key phrase. So the ordinary people, we ordinary people, uh, unenlightened people, uh, have no proper development of our minds, citta, because we don't understand as it is this luminous nature. And then the second sentence, next sentence is, that it, it, however, or whatever, how you want to interpret this is a very deep one. It is free, the mind is free of these uh, adventitious defilements that the instructed uh, disciple of the noble ones understands as it is. Therefore, the instructed disciple of the Buddha does have. Uh, the ability to develop his or her mind. That's Chittabhavana Atiti Wadami is kind of an emphasis, I declare. So those two lines show the key, the uh, understanding of this brightness, lumin luminosity uh, of the mind is a key. Understand, no, if you don't understand it, then uh, you don't have much chance to develop the mind. So it's when you realize, realizing this condition of the mind that gives you, gives people the ability to develop, cultivate their minds. So yes, the luminosity is there and these passages show that it is uh, very important. And that mm -hmm. I think does run through, but we don't have much, historical evidence to trace the, the tra trajectories of these ideas. Mm -hmm. And it does reappear, as you mentioned, and as uh, Ajahn Jack mentioned, it, mm -hmm. it comes into the uh, Sama Araham and other meditation traditions of ancient Siam. Mm. Um, thank you, Ajahn. Um, this is Wonderful. It really underscores the, the centrality of luminosity in, uh, uh, in the, in the sociology presented by um, Angutara Nikaya. Um, yeah, as I say, I think this is really a key passage and mm -hmm. it uh, can be unpacked in multiple ways to our benefit. Mm -hmm. Another sutra I want to ask you um, to share your knowledge and wisdom on is the Chulla Sunata Sutta, the Little Emptiness Sutra. 
or the lesser emptiness, I don't know what the right translation is. Anyway, um, the sutta is going to talk about how the field of perception is void of uh, desire and being and ignorance. But then it also talks about what is not void, what is present. You know? So the sutra talks about understanding what is void to be void and then to also understand what is not void, what is present to be present, almost uh, giving the same theory as the Tathagata Garbha Sutras do, that you know, what is empty is the, um, uh, what is what are empty are the adventitious defilements or what are you know, what don't exist are really the temporary defilements that Buddha nature is empty of them. But then the Buddha nature is not really empty of itself kind of theory <laughs> that there is a real sort of a, a thing, a, a real sort of presence. Um, this almost to me sounds like a very strong argument one could use for the Tibetan Shentong position on Buddha nature. Um, uh, how does this sutra, this statement, uh, fit in the general understanding of the Pali tradition? And uh, what's your take? Um, how would you see this? Uh, that question is too difficult for a simple minded person like me, I think. <laughs> But uh, that sutra defines, gives a method of understanding emptiness, which is by uh, seeing what is there physically in the, in the field of perception, uh, like in the forest, you see the trees. And so the monk, the uh, meditator, is aware of what is there. And then, oh, there's no people, for example, in the forest. Hopefully there's no cars or helicopters. So he's aware that the forest is there and mm. that these other things are not. So it's a kind of a meditative practice of being aware of what is directly before you. Mm. And so that is the practical aspect of it. And then it is translated into a more abstract that you mentioned. So mm. it can be <clears throat> said that what is sunya, what is the empty of, and what is it not empty of. I didn't bring that passage here. I have to confess that this is one of the Mahasutras that I'm trying to uh, finish the translation of. Finish means I've been translating it for around 40 years. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to finish this translation. And both of the two, both of the Sunyata Suttas in their Pali versions and their Tibetan Mahasutra versions are very difficult. They are very deep. And the the Pali version, the one you have mentioned, the Chula Sunyata Sutta, is to me neglected. That means it's preserved in the Tipitaka, but it is not emphasized in any, it is not singled out into any kind of, again, to any kind of a system of emptiness or anything. So we have to get uh, interpreted according to our own insights. And so what I did want to share here is that this passage you mentioned is Lester Shunita Sutta is actually the key to the Madhyanta Vibhaga Maitreya's Madhyanta Vibhaga. And you look here, actually, first one is more of an introductory verse. Verses two and three are actually summarizing the passage you mentioned. I can't mm -hmm. go into that now. They're not easy to translate. But the abhuta parikalpasti dvayam tatrana vidyati shunyata vidyate tvatra tasyam api sabidyate. So it combines the idea that sunyata is there, but at the same time, there is 
it's empty, but there is also the false instructions, false imagination, abhuta parikalpa. And then you get na shunyang na picha shunyang. So it's, ne it's neither empty nor is it not empty. Therefore, it is uh, spoken for all. And then sattva, such as it's, uh, <laughs> and then this is the uh, majima pratipat. So this, to unpack all of this, this is the middle way, is expounded by that sutra. So we should not be uh, hung up by the basic idea of emptiness and non-emptiness. Actually, mm. the sutra itself is already going beyond as in this verse. And in the commentary to this verse, this is the karika, the verse attributed to Maitreya. And the commentary actually quotes the same sutra you referred to, to mm. explain this. So mm. that lesser sunyata sutra, maha sutra, is a key to the work of one of the works of Maitreya. Mm. Mm. And these works are really wonderful the, the, to me. The, uh, these works attributed to Maitreya, the root texts are all of them, most of them are in verse, very fine, well composed verse, very well organized summary and progression of thought of the uh, Madhyanta Vibhaga, the Ratnagotra Vibhaga, and so on. So that is a wonderful thing. And how these masters transmitted these ideas from the basic concepts of the sutras and translated them into verse, into whole new systems of thought is really something wonderful mm. Mm. and also it's really um refreshing really wonderful to also know how you have the pali suttas and mahayana shastra here sort of uh, coming together um uh, basically having the same sort of core message um along those lines i want to ask also ajan about this um now, in the Buddha Nature Sutras, sometimes the Buddha Nature is presented as uh, Self, Atman. And then you have also um, the Pali uh, Canon. I, think I don't quite know the Sutra, but I think uh, um, this verse is often cited. See, the Buddha saying, Ananda, you should have Self as an island have self as refuge, do not have other things as refuge. So, uh, atta diva, viratha, atta sarana. And this kind of interpretation, of course, again, is taken up by Samaaran to refer to a sort of a bigger self that transcends samsara and nirvana, or the ordinary conceptual self, at least. Um, so, we have again, any Pali Sutra sources that link very well with this? Can we say that, um, just like the case of luminosity in Anguttara Nikaya and the Shunatta in Chula Shunatta Sutta, you have this concept of Atta also presented systematically in the Buddha Nature Sutras? Uh, systematically is always a problem for the early mm. sutras. Uh, there are many discussions of self. Some of them are ambiguous. And it all, of course, always depends on how you or I, the reader, the listener, interprets the word self. So that is what, to me, that is mm. one of the uh, problems, you could say, it's sort of been sort of like a dialogue of the deaf, the two different sides aren't really listening to each other because they're talking about different definitions of self. So that you really have to take on, I think, an individual basis that the 
uh, different interpretations have been followed in Theravada living tradition, Theravada meditation traditions within the school of Theravada in Southeast Asia, particularly in Siam or Tha old Siam or Thailand. That is one of the things that Mantan Jack was talking about in his in his uh, conversation. So yes, there is a great scope for understanding ourselves in this concept of self. And there's also a great scope for misunderstanding ourselves or misunderstanding what others are talking about if we over overreact. And if mm. we say dogmatically, oh, but there's no self in Buddhism, so how can you say that? Mm. Now, the problem here is, I talked about in, I've written about in another context, the so-called Pudgalavada, or the, the school that asserted a, an existing person. Now, they quote sutras in which the Buddha says, I, at that time, was, for example, Vesantara. And uh, the, it's impossible, actually, in human language, it's impossible for us to avoid referring to ourselves or using the word I. So we have to carefully examine what is the referent of the I, and that is part of the uh, various meditation practices, whether the I is the physical body, whether the I is the feeling. So going through, for example, the five aggregates, who is this I, what is this I? Is the I really there? And is the I a separate convention or entity outside of the aggregates? So there are many subtle discussions on this mm. subject. And I, me, <laughs> am not uh, qualified to give a detailed answer in such a short period for this, I'm afraid. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Uh, if, I was mm, I was curious, uh, just like um, Prabhasara and Shunata cases earlier, if the Atta case here also, the Atta Deepa and the Atta Sarana presented in the Pali may have any some link to the the Atman presented in the Buddha Nature Sutras. Um, I think at this <laughs> point. Maybe, Mm. Ajahn, we uh, see if the audience have any questions, and if there are, we'll take questions from the audience, and then um, if there aren't, we'll get back to our discussion. Okay. There is one question, and hopefully there should be some more coming in soon. Uh, the first question from John Newman. Very interesting talk, Peter. Thank you. I think the outcome <coughs> probably Prabhasvara passage is also found in the Gandhari scroll of the Prajnaparamita, which, if memory serves, has been C14 dated to around the first century CE. Also, I believe some scholars have argued that the Pali Prabhasaram passages are relics of Mahayana in Sri Lanka. Can you comment on that theory? Uh, okay, thank you. There are, I think, two questions here. And one, the reference to the early first century BCE, possibly, Pajna Paramita. So that is fine. There's no reason it should not be an early idea. And as I said, these circulated as ideas, not as texts. So it's finding its, this Vasra idea, finding its way into a early Pajya Paramita in the first century BCE is to me fine. Uh, the second part that it's a relic, these ideas are relics of Mahayana in Sri Lanka, I would not really say. We don't have a good history. Uh, 
of that. Mahayana was prevalent, Mahayana and also some tantric practice, esoteric practice was widespread and even prevalent in Sri Lanka. Uh, don't ask me when, let's say, fifth, sixth, seventh century, eighth century, around that period. So that is a later period that there was explicit uh, Mahayana practice we know from inscriptions and so on. That also is no problem. But I think that the Pabasura passages are much earlier than that, and they spread through different schools and Nikayas. So Prabhasara statement would have uh, definitely preceded the um, sort of uh, inscription, the uh, writing down of the Pali Canon, I suppose. Uh, yes, it has to, yeah, as a set of ideas and a set of remembered texts, because let's remember the Buddhist uh, texts or orature, literature or orature, as we may call it, were transmitted for five, roughly 500 years after the Buddha uh, died, Buddha passed away, and then the Buddhist texts were not written down till, let's say, we now have some evidence for early, the first century BCE, and <clears throat> certainly first century CE, the text began to be written down. So we have 400, 500 years of oral transmission. And during that, the scriptural collections were formed. And I believe they were formed and they were uh, standardized by the different Nikayas who by that time were spread to different parts of India. So different schools transmitted their uh, memory. They were the uh, guardians of the heritage of the Buddha's words, and they transmitted them, and I think fairly continually edited them, updated them, and eventually began to write them down. So that was a very long process, and certainly the Pabhasra and other uh, teachings. Now we talk a lot, a lot, we uh, opinionated scholars talk about this text is early, this text is late, but that's often a kind of a subjective. We don't have any real dates for the different sets of ideas. We have, if we have some Gandhari texts now that are datable in terms of their physical carbon dating and so on, or in terms of their uh, script, their paleography or language, we are getting somewhere. And that, that this is new. So we mm -hmm. can make sort of new, newer chronologies are there. Tibetan translations, of course, are much later. And even the early, earlier Chinese translations are still, what, six, seven hundred years after the Buddha. So we have to always sort of factor in this idea, which is hard for us to understand. I, uh, very briefly, <laughs> comparative research, you, see, you look at the Christian and uh, Jewish traditions, the scriptures uh, do involve, I think, some concepts, some notions of orality, certainly, but basically the gospel, the teaching of Jesus is very much connected with written records. And the four books, I guess it is, of the four great disciples are conceived of as written documents from the beginning. And in the Christian art, you always see the uh, four great disciples, often see the four great disciples, each of them holding a pen or a stylus and carrying writing in a book. Now, art and reality uh, intersect in various ways and, and do not. 
and can conflict in various ways. And it cannot be used as any kind of absolute evidence. But we should say that I don't think there's any, there's hardly any Buddhist representations of Shariputra or Ananda or others holding pens and writing down because the emphasis is always on this oral transmission. And in fact, there are a few Chinese, late Chinese, but that mean maybe 10th century or later, paintings that show the Buddhist council, so-called, or the formation of the canon with the monks writing down Chinese characters in Chinese style books. These are, of course, later reconceptualizations. So these are all very fascinating mm. uh, fields of re research and endeavor. And I think we uh, have to re-examine a lot of the early materials. And we have to certainly, it's very important to mention the Gandhari manuscripts, which have really changed our understanding of the development of Buddhist scriptures very, very much, very important. So again, talking about uh, the complexity of the transmission of these ideas and teachings, and also how little we know, um, can you elaborate a bit on the passage that you have shared on the screen? I think that this is something very interesting. Um, uh, the Middle oh, Indic okay. words from the okay. uh, Radnagotra Vivar Babasha. Yeah, thank you. Mystery of a Middle Indic verse. This is, mm -hmm. seems not to be especially noticed, but when I read Ratnagotra Vibhaga, then I was surprised. It's, uh, verses are in superb Sanskrit, and the commentary is in Sanskrit prose. I think both are very well composed, very well conceived works, both the verse and the commentaries. And so, amidst all this Sanskrit, the commentary cites a verse in the Middle Indic language, which is very close to Pali, but is not found in any known Pali text. What language is it? We can argue about that. I think the scholars uh, might have different opinions. Is it a canonical Middle Indic? Uh, and of which, which school? Or is it actually Pali? Or is it another Buddhist Prakrit? The introduction is actually in Sanskrit. That's part of the Shastra. That eva we should go to the datum. Abhisandayoktam. Uh, so that is a deep phrase in itself. And then you get uh, Bryn, Bryn Hulzel in his excellent book, translates having in mind the pure disposition, the Vishuddha Gotram, uh, the Tathagata element, it is said. And then, Yatta Patra Chunna Me Jata Rupa Melicity, Parikamena Tadditam Evang Loke Tathagata Iti. This is hard to say is anything but Pali or certainly a Middle Indic verse. Uh, Brunholz will translate it just as within stony debris, pure gold is not seen and then becomes visible through being purified. Tathagatas become visible in the world. Uh, my sort of freer translation is Gold is not visible in gravel or in dust, in unworked ore. You can only see it once the ore's been worked. Just so, just so, just so is the Tathagata in this world, in the hearts of living beings. Now, if we look at the original, we have this parikamena tadditam. It is seen by means of parikamma. Uh, so through being purified, and me through what? Uh, once it's been worked, once the ore's been worked. Parikamena means to work, it can be to purify. 
interestingly, parikama in Thai pronounced bodhikam is an important term in Thai mental cultivation of sounds, mantras, and visualizations, nimitta, and relates, you can say, particularly to what karma you've mentioned as the sama arahang or the hang tradition. So there is no explicit historical link between this passage and that, but there is this interest interesting juxtaposition of ideas that comes straight up into the uh, Buddha nature sutras that you have mentioned. So all of these connect. What this, ver where this verse comes from, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, let me get rid of it. Hello. Um, no? Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Oh. I share again. Share. Now I don't see you come. I don't hear you come. I muted to uh, not interrupt uh, with noise. Um, Marcus, any other question from the audience? At the moment, there's no questions. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Ajahn, if I may go back to the passage you read out, uh, are there passages in the Pali Canon, in the early Pali Sutras, talking about also um, stony debris and gold having to be extracted from the, the ore? Uh, or is this a verse in the, embedded in the Ratnagotra Vibhaga commentary, uh, not reflecting or not um, uh, not related to anything in the Pali Canon. Mm, difficult. As far as I recall, there is nothing similar mm -hmm. with this Patra Chum Nam Hi and the idea of finding gold, but I would be, I'm hesitant to <laughs> assert that vehemently because there are many similes both in the Pali and in Vaipulya or Mahayana Sutras that mm. involve gold and working mm. with gold. Um, and so it's, gold is very commonly referred to as a precious thing, which is, mm. of course, can be Buddha nature. And gold is, of course, found in, buried in the ore. So we always have to, to work out the gold. And in the uh, sutras I translated in questioning the Buddha, there are no, I didn't choose, and these are just things that interested me. I didn't choose anything connected to the um, Buddha nature as such. There are several that do refer to gold. Uh, where is it? <laughs> uh, Buddha's as rare as a grain of golden sand, and particularly one of the others, excuse my memory, the sutra comparing bodhicitta to gold. So gold mm -hmm. is, uh, bodhicitta is also frequently compared to gold, I think. Mm -hmm. So the use of gold in similes does pervade both Pali and other works, the works of Ashvagosha. And so there are articles and references to the use of gold in the cities <clears throat> and metaphors. Mm. Mm. So I think in a sense, the sutra language is couched in metaphor. Mm. And often it's not explicitly explained, and as I was saying earlier, it is not uh, systematized mm. in the way we might like to do, or nowadays people can be assigned or choose to do a thesis, a research on 
the use of gold as a simile in the works of Ashwagosha. Uh, someone did something along that line, very good work. And so nowadays our academic method and our access, our increased access to a wide range of texts from different periods in different languages gives us the ability to make broader surveys of such things, which mm -hmm. can both be, uh, of course, can be very valuable. It can also sometimes be uh, deceptive. If you look for one thing, then you ignore, you know, have the danger of ignoring others. So then I, that's why I can answer a lot of these questions. And this particular one, no, to me is really a mystery. And it shows again how little we know, or we can say how I, I, I think that our study is based on a, or the background of our study is one of loss. Large numbers of scriptures were lost in India. Some of them were translated into Tibetan or Chinese or other languages, but there is an enormous amount of loss. And that would include this, if nobody ever comes up with it, uh, I don't think they have. And if no one finds it in a Chinese translation, for example, or anywhere, then we can say that here this verse, the original source is lost. And certainly, as far as anybody knows, the original Indic source, Indic language, the uh, Prakrit or the Middle Indic form of this is not found, but it echoes so many other texts. And the idea of the, you mentioned the uh, stony debris, the gravel, the the uh, rocks and gravel that is found in some of the similes of the of the Ratnagotra and the other Tathagata Garbha sutras, saying mm -hmm. that the Buddha nature is something that is very precious, like gold hidden within the uh, broken stones or in the natural ores. So I think these are this is a theme throughout Buddhist texts. And it is often not drawn out. Maybe this results, results to the uh, explicit sutras and the ones that need to be drawn out, the neyarta and the nitarta. Mm -hmm. So we have to consider that many sutras are neyarta, that we mm -hmm. have to draw out the meaning through study through our teachers and through our own insights. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, if there are no further questions, I think um, we there, can... There's a couple things, maybe just a short follow-up. Uh, could you comment on the Abhisandhi in introduction to the mystery verse? Oh, okay. That's difficult. You can see Brunholzo has having in mind the uh, pure disposition. So Vishuddha is pure, Gotram is disposition. So the pure disposition of beings uh, with reference to. So I interpret. Uh, Abhisandhi here is meaning with reference to the Tathagata Datu, the Tathagata element. And uh, so that's good, that's difficult, yeah. So it is said, so that is implying that the Tathagata element, the Tathagata Datu, which can be taken as the Buddha Datu, or again, the Buddha nature, so this 
verse is explicating that the Buddha nature is found in found through effort in the ordinary things, patra chunam hi. And the Vishuddha Gotrang means that the individual that can find this has to have the pure lineage or the pure disposition. So this is very interesting also in the broader terms of tariki jiriki or whatever, the idea of, as I mentioned earlier too, that the that it is free of the upakilesa. Mm -hmm. And here it is said explicitly that the Buddha nature is seen through being purified, or mm -hmm. uh, once the ore has been worked. So this shows to me that this. Mm -hmm verse is recommending that we do have to do spiritual practice. It's not mm -hmm. saying we are already Buddhas, so therefore we can just relax and have a good time. Um, so I think that is an important key here, this parikamma, which comes again into up to modern times even, parikam, of uh, recitations, visualizations and so on. So we, this verse recommends to me that we do have to do practices, we do have to do porikam. It's not the school in Amitabha Buddhism where, where Amitabha will do everything. So this is a different, uh, this is a clear recommendation for uh, self effort, efforts. But these are, yeah. I think these short things are very wonderful. We can talk about them for yeah. hours and days and so on. And I you know, encourage that and for people to suggest alternate interpretations and so on. Yeah, looking at the final uh, part of the verse, I think in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, this could easily fit to explain um, the coming of the Buddha to the world rather than Buddha nature being unraveled. Um, but then, of course, in this context, it's being used to perhaps talk about the Buddha nature that can be revealed rather than a Buddha coming to the world. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, I quite uh, agree, and actually what you're talking about is a very difficult, it's a kind of a dual nature of mm. saying that, that the Buddha is coming into the world and the Buddha nature is in the world, and mm. so this creates a kind of a contradictory thought. And if we are talking about bringing the Buddha into our world through our insight, realization, practice, us, us mm. becoming Buddhas, then that is also, mm. it's both the Buddha that we experience within us through luminosity or through other uh, meditative practices, that is there, but at the same time, that is the Buddha, for example, in the very nice images that Marcus showed at the beginning of this of this uh, presentation. So they actually are uh, non-dual, they're adwaya. They are uh, not separate. The Tathagata appearing in the world and the Tathagata appearing in the heart, hearts mm. of living beings. Well, I have a final question for Ajahn, and um, that regards the term Gotra um, that we see in this, on this uh, slide, Novishuddha Gotra. So Gotra, especially when used in the context of Buddha nature, teachings almost equates, is equated with Buddha nature. But then we have in the earlier texts, 
um, Gotra is particularly coming in three forms, the, the Sravaka Gotra, the Pratyaka Buddha Gotra, and then the Bodhisattva or the Buddha Gotra. So how do you see the evolution of the, the three bodhis as the ultimate goal, the three Gotras that that are seen as like the disposition for these three bodies and gradually evolve into the Buddha nature tree theory where you only have one gotra and that's the Buddha gotra. Do you see such evolution in the Pali sources as well? Most likely not, but you definitely see it in the Rana gotra Vibhaga and other Mahayana sources. Um, how would have that evolution happen? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. I have not really ruminated much on that, and I can agree with the basic outline that you offer. So yeah, there are the three bodhis. And these three bodhis, the Savaka, Pacheka, Buddha, and Sama, some Buddha, fully enlightened Buddha, I think that the early schools, the 18 schools, those of which we have some of their scriptures all refer to this, and I will mention one in particular is the Samatiya, or the so-called uh, personalist or Putkulavada. Mm -hmm. They have a system, we do have some of their texts preserved, of how each of these uh, bodhis are attained. And so do the Sarvastivada, and so do the Theravada. These are the ones for which we have some, some information. So all also the early schools that we know believed that these three bodhis existed and were attainable. And it seemed to me that at one point, uh, one group of practitioners, of people, uh, took over the bodhisattva path and said, this is the only path, and tried to um, subsume the others within the bodhisattva path or, or uh, uh, deal with them in different ways. Of course, the classic might be the Lotus Sutra, which says that your attainments as arhats are only, only a step. It's an illusion. You still have to go on to Buddhahood. So they took on different uh, hermeneutical positions to uh, reclassify these first two bodhis as not uh, true bodhis, not worthwhile, and subsumed everything under you. Have to, everybody has to become a Buddha. Everyone has to become a full Buddha. So that is a very polemical period uh, that needs more teasing out and so on. So yes, the emphasis on everyone becoming a Buddha, and that connects to the Buddha Nature Sutras, which uh, say that all beings have the potential to become a Buddha or a Tathagata. But then again, you come to the problem of which Buddha? What kind of Buddha? Is it a <laughs> Savaka Buddha? And in the Pali tradition, these, that idea, that universal recommendation to be, for everybody to strive to be a Bodhisattva and attain Buddhahood, that did not really seem to occur. It does occur in the sense that it was widespread. And I think that that's something else, or that's connected with the pervasiveness of Jataka in the Buddhist culture of Southeast Asia. So the main, one of the main ways to teach Buddhism, teach the Dharma was through the Jatakas in which the leading figure, the hero, is a bodhisattva aiming for Buddhahood. So he was the key figure in the whole narrative world of, 
uh, Southeast Asian Buddhism. So it was natural for people to desire, aim for the highest. Mm -hmm. So the idea of aspiring to become a Buddha is actually widespread. You see it in many manuscript colophons or in inscriptions of donation of uh, Buddha images or relics. The people want the merit of this to contribute to them becoming a Buddha, Buddha Homi Anagate. So I think that was a kind of natural development in Theravada society is not quite the same as the blanket uh, statement in some of the uh, more polemic Mahayana Sutras that everybody should, everybody must become a Buddha. That was more a natural development. So these are very complex and we have to study them uh, carefully and cautiously and not, I think, uh, take position for these, this or that polemical mm. faction. Mm. Well, it's uh, quite late for you, Jan. Um, so um, I think we'll uh, draw the conversation to a close. Uh, there is one the very quick question from John Newman. So John is asking whether Prabhasara Chitta is conditioned or unconditioned in the Theravada school. And if there's any discussion about it. Okay, I only know a little bit, so I can't say. I don't think I've seen any discussion of this point, and I don't think there are any explicit mm -hmm. statements one way or the other that it is conditioned or unconditioned. Le uh, with the uh, emphasis that jitta is a conditioned state. And so perhaps the if you fit it into, and I have not read texts on this, it may be already there. If you try to explain it in terms of the Abhidharma system, it is a kind of citta. So then they would ask, is it kusala, kusala, abhyakata, whether it's wholesome, unwholesome, or indetermined. And there can be different propositions, maybe not unwholesome, but is it uh, wholesome, kusala, or is it un undetermined, avyakata? Uh, so all of these things, I think that is for the uh, sphere of the Abhidharma experts. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jan Peter. I think, thank um, you, Karma, for having me. It's so nice to see you. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it was wonderful to listen to you after so many years and thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge on the early sutras and also thanks everyone joining us from around the world so have a good thank night. you all for joining and thank you for your questions yes thank you so much wonderful thank you too marcus have a wonderful weekend Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Same to all. Thank you.